Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, Kamala Harris does a big sit-down interview about her economic plan and heads to the border as she tries to neutralize Donald Trump's advantage on two big issues. Meanwhile, Trump wants you to know that he thinks Iran is trying to kill him and that you can buy a new Trump watch for the low, low price of $100,000. <laughs> <laughs> and Strict Scrutiny's Melissa Murray stops by to talk with us about what she heard from some undecided black women voters in her new MSNBC special. But first... Kamala Harris has had another busy week with less than 40 days left in a campaign that could not be closer. She's headed to Arizona to visit the southern border. Uh, on Thursday, she spent the day in D.C. being vice president, first at an event with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, then at an event with President Biden to announce some new steps on gun safety. On Wednesday night, she sat down for an interview with MSNBC's Stephanie Rule to talk about the economic plan she laid out during a big speech uh, in Pittsburgh. Here she is talking about price gouging and responding to Trump's claim that she didn't really work at McDonald's. How do you go after price gouging without implementing price control? Just to be very frank, I am never going to apologize for going after companies and corporations that take advantage of the desperation of the American people. And I, as attorney general, I saw this happen in the midst of an emergency, whether it be an extreme weather event or even the pandemic, we saw it where those few companies, not the majority, not most, but those few companies that would take advantage of the desperation of people and jack up prices. Yeah, I'm going to go after them. Yes, I'm going to go after them. I just want to ask you yes or no. Okay. At any point in your life, have you served to all beef patties, special sauce, <laughs> lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions <laughs> on, on a sesame, sesame seed, seed bun, bun <laughs> working at a McDonald's? Yes or no? That's it. I have. OK, now the other job. Now and, the other but job. it was okay. not a small job. Like, I did okay. the fries. I mean, I, you know, yes, okay, for but a small I did. Period of time. But then let me ask about a big job. But, but, but to your point, if you don't mind, before Please. you get to the big job. It's a, there's a, part of the reason I even talk about having worked at McDonald's is because there are people who work at McDonald's in our country who are trying to raise a family. I worked there as a student. I was a kid who worked there trying to raise families and pay rent on that. And I think part of the difference between me and my opponent includes our perspective on the needs of the American people. And what our responsibility then is to meet those needs. Uh, she did fries. That's, you know, that's a. That's do you know, I'm not to derail this thing, but do you know the origin of the conspiracy theory that she didn't work at McDonald's? Because Trump says it all the time. Yes. He, there is a, uh, one of those dumb uh, blue checked right wing accounts that pretends to be news said that McDonald's stepped forward and said that they have no record of Kamala Harris ever working there and that's just not true it was just completely made up so he took McDon he took the fake rumor or the fake news that McDonald's said that she never worked there to mean that she was lying but that just never happened but uh Okay. Also, <laughs> what sort of records do we think McDonald's keeps about an I Oakland know, franchise from 40 years ago? That's the best part. <laughs> and then they, like, long ago they accused her, when she first said it, they accused her of, like, not having it on her resume when she, like, sent her <laughs> resume out after law school. Because, like, yeah, it's like, you know what? I don't put fucking CVS on my resume. <laughs> Although I haven't sent a resume around in quite some time. Um, anyway, how do you think she did in the interview? Great. I thought it was... Great. I was so many thoughts on this interview. One, not an easy interview. Like no, this, I think the thought is, is MSNBC. It's Stephanie Rule. That it'll at least be a friendly interview. And it wasn't unfriendly, but those were she asked tough questions. And it was all and, about the economy. It wasn't. I mean, she she asked one question on reproductive rights at the very end, but most of the interview was all economy and economic policy and details and all of that. And it's like it took her like one question to warm up, and then she was just throwing fastballs the whole time. It's just it was when she asked the question about why people trust Donald Trump more, she got you could see like like a little fire in her eyes, and she went like right hard at the contrast, and it was really good. And I have two takeaways from this. One is more interviews. Like she's she's really good at it when she, especially if it's an issue that she when it's about something real, right? A bunch of like the marginalia, stupid bullshit that comes up in a lot of like horse race stuff in interviews. That's hard for any politician when they ask you to be pundit. But when she's talking about something she cares about, she's excellent. Second, I kind of think that if Trump is unwilling to agree to this CNN debate, they should challenge him to an economic debate. Mm. Could be on CNN, could be on other network, but 
Like, think about she just has he has the advantage in perception, but it's like a mile wide and inch deep. And she has the better message, the better policies. She's the better messenger. The contrast is it moves vote share. We've seen that in message testing and polling. And so finding opportunity to go back and forth with Trump only on the like he'll obviously do insane stuff, but primarily on the economy for 90 minutes, I think could be a huge advantage. I was watching this interview. I agree. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was her best sit down interview yet uh, since becoming the nominee. Um, I realize she hasn't done a ton. Everyone's upset. <laughs> I was going to say best of four, right? Yeah, but I think it was the best one. And you're right that she always takes a like the first question to warm up, and she always answers the first question by like thinking, and she's like looking. She, you can tell that she's like trying to figure out what value statement to start with. Mm. It's very clear that she has been through debate prep. And we know this because yeah. we've done this with Obama and and he hated this. <laughs> but they tell you in debate prep, no matter what the question is, your answer should start with a topic sentence that just uh, communicates your values about the issue. doesn't matter what the actual question was, right? And she did that very well during the debate. And I think that for questions that you don't really want to answer or the answer would be too politically tricky or whatever, um, it's a good thing to do. I I noticed that as we got into the meat of the interview, like she just sounded she sounded wonkier and more detailed, but I liked it. It sounded less like a politician talking in cliches and more like someone who just really knows the policy and knows the issue. And I think it just came across oddly since it was wonkier, but it came across more informal and colloquial and just real, you know, than some of the like I, I'm it's very good that she's talking about her middle class upbringing. Very good that she's talking about how she sees the economy. But I would just like dial it a little. I dial it down just a little bit, which she did in this interview and mm. just answer the questions and start talking about the policy. Yeah, it. You almost have to deprogram candidates after debate because what is good for debate is generally terrible for an interview. Yeah. Because you're told to not answer the debate question or you're supposed to answer it with the answer you want, not the question was asked. That can work in a press conference. It can't really work in a one-on-one -on -one sit-down mm -hmm. interview. And so that first question was, let me go big picture and do all of this. And then everything else is just like, I'm just going to answer the question. And it just comes off more authentic and real. And it was very, very good. And the further she's gotten away from the debate, I realized I just proposed another debate, so I could be screwing us here. But um, her in each subsequent interview, her questions, her answers have been more on point to the question, which I think is to her benefit. Yeah, I think it's always the questions that she typically gets tripped up on are questions about like they're hypotheticals, which are always annoying ones to answer. But like Stephanie Rule asked her, like, what's going to happen if uh, you can't get Republican votes for your tax plan? You know, and then she didn't want to answer that question. But I do think even uh, even on something like that, it's like, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose a tax plan and I'm going to negotiate. And what I hope is also that I have uh, members of Congress who are going to work with me to lower taxes for middle class Americans and raise them on the rich. And that's what I'm going to try to do. You know, like it's pretty. <laughs> or we're just going to we're going to win the Senate. Right. Or we're going to win. The, yeah, yeah. That's why we're going to win the Senate. Like I just some of the I think some of these answers are easier than um than she's making them out to be or maybe she thinks that like she's not supposed to say it anyway i thought she was great through like 95 percent of the interview and like the best she's been on this and she should do more um what do you think of the big pittsburgh speech my take away from watching the speech was good speech poll tested through the roof like it had the policy proposals are popular it wasn't just a litany of a bunch of like economic white paper vomit uh on stage it was like an, it was it was thematic. It, it spoke to the broader theme of her as someone with a middle class background who's going to fight for middle working class people, while Donald Trump's going to fight for the wealthy. So that was very good. I do watch these speeches now and still sort of wonder what the impact of these big set set speeches are in this day and age. Um, obviously, it's in Pittsburgh. If you're going to do it, do it someplace where you're going to get lots of local coverage. I'm sure we're going to see ads that take. Um, parts of that speech and put it together for an economic message. There will be some social media stuff, but how many outside of the ads are going to run for it later, or maybe the people watching Pittsburgh TV, how many people who don't know about her economic plans or want to know more about economic plans will actually consume that speech? I think that's sort of a fair question in this day and age. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, she hasn't given, cause she hasn't had the time. 
to give a lot of like major policy addresses. So you want to give your big economic major policy address. So that totally made sense for that. And it was a good speech. Um, I would love to see her do a version of that speech, basically cut it down so that it's a punchy stump speech on the economy and have a few more uh, contrast with Donald Trump. Or basically she had a lot of contrast with Donald Trump, but just yeah. kind of whittle the speech down to just her plan contrast with Donald Trump, her plan contrast with Donald Trump and and make it punchy for rally events. Um, because I, I agree, like I don't know exactly who's going to consume all of that other than the fact that you're right it, it could end up in some 30 and 60 second ads um but it was a, it was a it was a good speech you know and like you said it wasn't it wasn't wonky again there was a few times in that speech where she would she seemed like she was ad-libbing she was joking a little and i really liked those parts because it seemed yeah. it, she was more authentic she seemed like her she seemed like she was having a good time she seemed like she was connected with the material with the audience with what she was talking about like i think she just needs a little more of that on the trail and in interviews um because it's there and you, uh, you know i've seen her do it um but i think that's going to help with connecting with voters who are still uh, undecided um there's obviously a lot to say about her economic plan campaign also released an 82 page booklet titled a new way forward for the middle class um but for the people who may not have had the chance to skim through that book, uh, what do you think the campaign wants to convey about her economic agenda? Like, what are the big things they want voters to remember? I think they want, her, want people to know that she has a plan. Right? This is a, a classic tactic for a candidate who's new on the scene. Obama also released a plan. Mm -hmm. We had a book, in fact. I remember. An actual published I remember, book. I remember uh, editing the book. Long book. I'm sure, I remember you enjoying that process thoroughly and thinking what a great use of your time while, while either writing or editing three rally speeches a day. Well, uh, somebody, I, mean, I know so book. many people read it, you know. I think it was a bestseller, John. Yeah, of course. Uh, for, honestly, anyone can do that these <laughs> days, as we know, but... Um, so it's just like having a plan, right? She has a plan. That's one. The bit, it is just notable in that speech that she's, she announced she's a capitalist. Yeah. Um, which she said during the convention speech too. Yes, she did. And I think there is a argument here is that she is a mainstream middle-class Democrat who's going to fight for middle-class people. Like that is the, all the policy undergirds that. That's what it's all about. They really want the footage of her standing up there saying she's going to fight for middle class people and that she's a capitalist. And it is to push back against a caricature of her that is showing up at all these ads. The, the Trump and the Trump super PACs have a bunch of ads up. They're pretty tough on the economy. They blame her for what people are unhappy about the economy. Unfairly blame her, obviously. And they have this audit. They have this video footage of her saying that Bidenomics is working. So they're trying to make her the candidate of the status quo and what you don't like. And they're trying to. Um, sort of push back against that in a pretty aggressive way. And that that's ultimately the political purpose of the speech. There's a headline in the New York Times that the Harris campaign was understandably and excitedly sending around, which was uh, uh, Harris makes a new, tries a new pitch, capitalism for the middle class. I was like, that that's that's it right there. That's, Capitalism for the middle class. <laughs> Where are we these days? I know. <laughs> it gets them away from Bidenomics, which was clearly not uh, the best branding. Um but yeah, capitalism for the middle class. She both gets the like, I'm mainstream and not comrade Kamala. And also like, I care about the middle class. And what I really liked both in the speech and in the MSNBC interview is that like when, when Stephanie Rule asked her about price gouging, she was like, I'm going to make, and she's like, well, how, you know, there's price gouging, but also how, how do you convince people that it's not price controls because they get nervous. And she's like, I'm not going to make any apologies whatsoever about going after big companies who take advantage of, Amer of the American people. And I didn't look at my record when I was AG. I did the same thing. I took, I went on after big banks. So it was great. So it's like, it wasn't, she's not like shying away and trying to be like a, a, a mushy centrist on the economy. Um, but she, you know, she's basically saying she's a capitalist and capitalism can work, but it does it has to work for everyone in this country because that's how the economy's strong and, and big corporations shouldn't be taken advantage and they should pay their fair share. Great. I'm sort of curious about the polling that led them to have that line, both in the convention and here. It's not something I've seen show up in any polling, uh, that this is a real issue for her. She obviously has an economic deficit. We can talk about how she has mm -hmm. narrowed that deficit pretty significantly, so, significantly narrowed it over where Biden was, mm -hmm. but even over the course of the campaign and the Echelon Insights poll, she's actually up one on the economy. Um, 
and she's only down four on the economy in the Pennsylvania poll that the Times put out last week. So she's ma- she has made gains there. Um, and that, I think that's one important thing. Like when you stand up and say, I'm a capitalist, that sounds like you're doing it from a defensive crouch. And I don't think that's what the speech was not a defensive speech. It was an offensive speech. It was an economic. I don't know. I don't know how much the campaign cares whether they actually win on the economy, but that they can make gains with the voters they need to make gains with on the economy of being aggressive. And they sort of showed that in the tone and tenor of this speech and the, and the interview. I think there's like a, a, a two different groups of voters here. There's the sort of center right indies, maybe Nikki Haley voters uh, that they're trying to go after. Also some young men too who I think her saying that she's a capitalist and she's no CEOs and has worked with them and all that kind of stuff, that's going to reassure those voters. And then there's the sort of low propensity, don't always vote, younger voters uh, tend to be disproportionately black and brown women to uh, non-college women that they're going after, who I think that the more populist middle class, here's what I'm going to do for you, middle class tax cut, child tax credit, um, and... Uh, some of the homeowner stuff like that, that's who they're targeting with that message. So I think it's probably both those groups. With all due respect to our green eye shade wearing economic policy nerd friends, it's all about advocacy. Yeah. Everything. It's who are you going to fight for? Yeah. That's the whole thing. It's all these policies, these tax credits, all these things that you talk about in the campaign are just a way to answer the question, will this politician fight for people like me or they fight for corporations or whoever else? And that that's the thrust of it. And that and that works and what is so appealing about that and so important is it works with everyone. It works for those right. Nikki Haley voters talking about it and it works for younger, younger, younger voters, more progressive voters, everyone else and everyone in the middle. Yeah, I agree. So this week she gave a serious policy address, stood next to a foreign leader who's at war, uh Zelensky at the uh in Washington. She announced a policy with the president at the White House. She's going to the border. I don't know if all this was intentional or just how the schedule turned out, but do you think they're uh, trying to sort of burnish her strong leader, commander in chief credentials with voters with some of these events? I I imagine just by the having been involved in the challenges of scheduling presidential candidates who off, who are also in office at the same time, that this was more a quirk in scheduling mm. that just happened to be this was the best time to give this economic speech and Zelensky was going to be in town and he wanted to meet with her. Trump announced this just now that he is meeting with Zelensky tomorrow or today if you're listening to this on Friday. Um, and so I think it's something you did. I think broadly speaking, they want to do two things. They want to show her that she's a strong presidential leader whenever you're trying to elect someone who looks unlike all the other presidents who came before them. Yeah. It's important to put them in situations that seem familiar. It's why Obama went on that foreign trip in 2008 and met with world leaders to, so that you, people could imagine him doing the things that presidents have done. So I think that's part of the Zelensky meeting. And going to the border is – and we can talk a little bit about politics of that, but it's also – just she is trying to show that she is a mainstream Democrat with with policies and values that are well within uh, the center. And I don't mean center like centrist, just that are not the they're not radical, I guess I would say. Right. She's being portrayed as this San Francisco radical. She's a black woman, open borders, letting people in. She has the burden of being part of the Biden administration, which has been president, which has been in office through these border surges. And this is a way, an opportunity to go to the border and speak about her actual policies and pushback against the character. So it's all of a piece, but I don't think this was a, I don't think there was a, uh, like a, there weren't a bunch of post-it notes on the, on the message calendar with this like three weeks ago, they kind of came together. Yeah. I do think that, and we've seen this in some of the ads too, because they have uh, images of her on foreign trips with foreign leaders, you know, walking by all kinds of world flags. (laughs) Like, I think they are trying to, what you said, like show her, doing what presidents do and you know she's been vice president for the last uh three and a half years so that's uh it's a helpful helpful job it should be sufficient it should be sufficient right yeah um all right so she's going to the border uh she's reportedly going to give a speech about border security and her record prosecuting cartels and human traffickers uh as as a border state attorney general so uh obviously an issue where trump has a big advantage and um he tried to uh pre-butt the visit uh, with a, a long and rambling press conference we're going to talk about in a little bit today. But uh, basically, the line he's been using for the last week is, you know, when she tells you about the border 
ask her just one simple question. Why didn't you do it four years ago? Uh, and he says that's true about every issue. Um, so Harris campaign clearly believes it's important for the VP to take on this issue directly and go right at one of Trump's uh, apparent strengths. There's also an argument to be made that whenever the campaign is about the border and that's where the media focus is, it's better for Trump. What do you think? I think this is the right thing to do. It is she's being aggressive. She's willing to take on risk. She understands that for some segment of voters, this is a real question. I mean, it's not just far right Fox News watching MAGA voters who care about immigration. It's a huge issue in Arizona and Nevada, two states that are absolutely critical uh, to one of her paths to 270 electoral votes. And so going there is important because she actually has a good message. Now, I hope when she goes there, she mixes it with a message about a broader, comprehensive solution to all of our immigration problems. So it's not just poor security. It's also um, dealing with uh, finding a pathway to citizenship and dealing with people who have been in this country for a long time, dealing with the dreamers. And pushing back also on Trump's proposals, his mass deportation proposal and all of that. So it should be of a piece. If it's just border security, then I think you are playing on Trump's territory. If it is going to the border to talk about border security, what you would do to secure the border and the broader proposals about comprehensive immigration reform, I think that is a very good thing to do. Yeah, I'm a big believer in, you know, when a voter has a concern Instead of saying, well, I know you might have that concern, but uh, let's talk about this issue instead where you agree with me. <laughs> it's like not a good strategy. <laughs> Alex Wagner show this week, she was in Michigan um, and she talked to a bunch of uh, union workers. Uh, and uh, it was interesting. Some of the older union workers were very pro Harris and the, some of the younger ones, especially the younger men, were a little more pro Trump. And a lot hmm. of them were talking about uh, immigration as the reason why hmm. and uh you know they were saying some of the things you hear directly from donald trump and a lot of the right-wing media that there's all these illegal immigrants coming in and it's an invasion and they're taking it was much more they're taking our jobs than anything else and or driving down wages or making housing more expensive hmm. and all that and you know i was watching that thinking like she i'm sure you know the campaign knows they need to be doing better with men and young men and in the Midwest and the and in like you said, and in the border states as well. And I kind of think that you've got to be able to answer the mail on that. And there's a lot of people who haven't even heard Kamala Harris's position on the border, even though she talked about it at the debate, talked about it in the convention speech, talks about it all the time. And, you know, if you can have some uh, an image of you at the border, and, you know, delivering a few solid lines and then that ends up in an ad, then I think it's probably useful, you know? I think you're exactly right about that. And it is just interesting going back to the question about these speeches is back in the day, the speech used to be the end in of itself. You'd give the speech, it would get the coverage, it would derive the political conversation. And now it's the initial piece of content that maybe people see, but they probably don't that you then use throughout the rest of the campaign. Like she's going to do this at the border. So I assume there are going to be images you can use that will be in these ads because She's getting hammered with immigration ads and her, her at the border with the image of the border talking about her policy is a much better response ad than your sort of typical voiceover response ads that no one really believes. And I'm sure she's going to kick the shit out of Trump there, too. Right. And talk about yeah. how he killed the border deal, um, which also gets it more attention because then they can get in the back and forth. Uh, speaking of Trump. Trump did his own economic event on Wednesday in North Carolina, uh, where standing in front of a giant banner that read jobs, 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 uh, he went on a long rant about how he thinks the Iranians are trying to kill him, and he's mad that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris aren't doing enough to stop them. Uh, here's how it sounded. As you know, there have been two assassination attempts on my life that we know of, and they may or may not involve but possibly do Iran. But if I were the president, I would inform the threatening country, in this case Iran, that if you do anything to harm this person, we are going to blow your largest cities and the country itself to smithereens. We're going to blow it to smithereens. You can't do that. It may or may not have to do with, but possibly yes. Yes. 
<laughs> I would like it to. May I would li- not have to do am, with literally I'm, anything. I am floating a completely unverified rumor that may or may not be true, but you should believe it's true. <laughs> um, so the backdrop here is that there's some actual intelligence about Iran uh, fucking with Trump's campaign. I believe right before we started recording, the Department of Justice uh, indicted uh, several Iranians and in, in ha- trying to hack the. Uh, Trump campaign, successfully hacking the Trump campaign. Um, The Trump campaign also asked for an intel briefing that they then read out to the press as containing, quote, real and specific threats against Trump's life. Uh, There is, of course, no evidence uh, that no one's seen any evidence. No one's put forward any evidence that either of Trump's would be assassins has any link to Iran. Uh, We also know that Iran has we have known for some time that Iran has been interested in uh, assassinating former President Trump, as well as various Trump administration officials uh, in retaliation for the Trump administration killing Soleimani. Um, and uh, so that that's true. They also, I think intelligence also says that they were, they've been trying to uh, assassinate current members of the Biden administration. So that's all out there. Why is Trump doing this at a rally this wasn't even like an ad lib kind of thing where he just went off it was in the prepared remarks his team previewed it to the press like what is he doing there is a part of his remarks where it was not in that clip where he talks in some probably not totally accurate detail about the fbi's inability to access the phones Mm -hmm. and the foreign messaging apps uh used by both of the the individual the individual who uh, in Butler and then in Florida, which is the kind of thing that if you are just watching, it's the kind of stuff that is very good at making people believe, buy into conspiracy theories. Like, hmm, that's weird. Why can't they own it? Oh, it's a far known one. Hmm, maybe there's a lot more questions to answer here. It's like QAnon, anti-vax, if it's like textbook conspiracy theory spreading. And they want to spread this conspiracy theory. And I know it is crazy. And it's weird to do it at a economic speech, <laughs> but this is straight out of the playbook of tin pot dictators all over the world is to make themselves a victim that's powerful forces somewhere are trying to take them out because they're such a threat to the system. Foreign sources whips up Foreign some nationalism sources. like there's they're they're trying to get the I'm USA so... and I am the USA. Right. Like that's the and, I mean, this is why so many people on like re- online liberals spouted very irresponsibly that this was a false flag. This is why you would have a false flag as for this purpose. Uh, There's no evidence for a false flag, but he's basically like six weeks late into running the second half of the play here um, after this. And so it's crazy. It's poorly delivered. It seems bizarre, but it's not it fits. It fits with how Trump has and people like Trump have sought power in the past. Like this is the way I'd say it. I think that they're also just trying to uh, squeeze all the political advantage they can out of the two assassination attempts. Just yeah. to be perfectly honest, <laughs> like they they know we know that the campaign and the Trump believed that like after the first assassination attempt, they thought they had basically put Joe Biden away. That they saw Trump's approval ratings increase. I think they're mad that that didn't last, right? Because then there was the switch, and Kamala Harris was the nominee, and so everyone sort of the 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 coverage of the first assassination attempt faded away, and then the second one happened, and so they they believe there's sort of a rally around Trump effect, and that he was getting some goodwill not just from his base voters, but from other voters, and they want to keep that in people's minds. They're going back to Butler, Pennsylvania. Um, where there was the first attempted assassination on October 5th for a rally. He keeps saying he's going to go finish his speech. I'm sure they're going to make a big deal out of that. Uh, I just don't know. I don't know how much that that gets you. Uh, I think it's a little it's a little weird to keep talking about the assassination attempt, especially after the uh, after the convention speech, the RNC convention speech, his acceptance speech, where he said, uh, I'm only going to tell this story once because it's too painful to ever talk about again. <laughs> I'm not sure. We can stipulate that Donald Trump's campaign is better in 2024 than it was the other two times, but I don't think it's that good. Yeah. <laughs> just just think about just this is the smallest point on this, but this is the kind of stuff that I obsess over. Why is he speaking in front of a banner that says "Jobs, Jobs, Jobs"? Because someone in the campaign, the unemployment- someone in the campaign knows that that's the better message. <laughs> well, yes, but even if let's say you're just doing an economic event, the unemployment rate's at historic low. 
the when you look at all this, the yeah, you can the say pulling like prices, 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 cost, cost, yeah, cost. exactly. It's just concerns about jobs are way down because the unemployment rate's at historic low. So prices, wages, there are all these other things, lower taxes, all those things. And so you pick jobs, jobs, jobs. It's just very amateur, is what I'd say. Well, let me tell you, if you thought that that event was weird, uh, see, this is my segue. The, <laughs> the press conference at Trump Tower on Thursday, whoo. Uh, we tried to grab some clips from it. We were going to do like a super cut. Honestly, though, most of it was too hard to follow. We, I, we couldn't even figure out clips. <laughs> he spent over an hour rambling and lying about Kamala Harris's trip to Arizona and her record on the border. One point he accused her of losing 325,000 children to sex trafficking. I couldn't even follow how or why. Uh, he pr he promised to liberate the city of Aurora. <laughs> okay. Uh, he also demanded an apology from ABC News for the debate. He attacked uh, moderators David Muir and Lindsey Davis. He, he came back around to David Muir after the first time, like 30 minutes later, came back around to attack him again. Uh, he called on Nancy Pelosi to be prosecuted for insider trading and for January 6th. Um, and he talked about Nancy Pelosi because he talked about her trying to push out Biden. And he said that they that Biden only stepped down because they were threatening him with the 25th Amendment. It was just this <laughs> long tangent. He started talking about how he owned property in San Francisco. He said that Caracas, Venezuela, had become a safe and wonderful city. Uh <laughs> Then he took a few questions. This was all before he took the questions. Yes. And then when he took a few questions, uh, he took one about the news that New York City Mayor Eric Adams was indicted Thursday on five federal charges of bribery, fraud, and soliciting illegal foreign campaign donations. And here's what he said. Uh, I will say this. I watched about a year ago when uh, he talked about how the illegal migrants are hurting our city and the federal government should pay us and we shouldn't have to take him. And I said, you know what? He'll be indicted within a year. And I was exactly right, because that's what we have. We have people that use the Justice Department and the FBI at levels that have never been seen before. So I wish him luck. I don't know anything about what he did, but so there it is. There it is. Donald Trump defending Eric Adams, the Democratic mayor of New York, because, hey, if you've been indicted, then you're on Donald Trump's side. Doesn't matter. Party doesn't matter at that point. And of course, and it was because of and, and he, he defended him because he said they were he was indicted because he was tough on immigration. We had our morning call to talk about the podcast. And we said that Donald Trump had a press conference scheduled for the day. And we said, I wonder if it's about Eric Adams. And John Favreau predicted almost to the word <laughs> what Donald Trump would say here. Knew it. About Eric Adams. I knew that's what he would do. I think it's time. I know. You re I've, make some, reevaluate some life choices here. I've really, I've spent too long with this man. But it was so, like, it would, it's just, it was so obvious. Well, you could sort of see it online too, because all of the like, right wing accounts and the blue check marks and the idiots that follow Elon Musk and Silicon Valley, all those dumbasses they were all starting with the like oh the democrats did this they, ha they had their conspiracies right mm -hmm. because what they don't want to admit is that uh the biden justice department which they have accused of uh you know weaponization and going after his political opponents has indicted uh the president's son hunter biden uh democratic senator bob menendez uh democratic house member henry cuellar and now the Democratic mayor of New York, Eric Adams. So did not doing a great job of going after Joe Biden's political opponents. <laughs> no, it does uh, not seem that way quite, at all. Quite an odd conspiracy that they're like, well, we got to if we're going to go after Trump, we got to pick five or six Democrats at random, including the president's own son to also go after. That's a, it seems like a real complicated plot. Um, but their answer is basically anyone that they've indicted, it's because they haven't done they haven't done what the Biden administration wanted, right? So Mayor, so Eric Adams was too tough on immigration. So I just, I knew Trump would go there. Plus, he just you, gave you, a press conference about immigration, and I figured, oh, this is a perfect, you, it's a perfect confluence of events, Dan. I think the listeners can decide whether this is a positive thing or a negative thing for you, but you absolutely nailed it. <laughs> what was that press conference, by the way? You and I were both, we're like texting while we were listening to it. That was fucking nuts. 
I know we say that at every single press conference, but it... In the history of time, I'm not sure any man has been that crazy and that boring at the same time. Yeah, it is. It's like it, like it was hard to follow. It got really boring. And he had no energy, no energy. And the fact that it was so boring sort of dulled like the extreme shit he was saying about migrants. Like he was doing a lot of the like the the migrant, like the gory stories about like rape and murder and all it was just it was it was it was both disgusting and boring if that's a if that can be the yeah that can be it's the not case. it's just yeah just terrible just absolutely terrible to listen to not interesting alarming that this man is a point or two away from being president of the united states just just truly terrible and it was i don't he was looking at notes the whole time so did someone <laughs> write that's his. 55 minutes of remarks. <laughs> I think he would like read a line and then sort of go off on a tangent. I have a, like a smaller strategic question, which is like, why did he do a press conference at Trump Tower the day before she goes to the border? Why didn't why not like do something quick after she goes and like get in the news that it was just very weird. It's just he's not doing very much. He's not even leaving his home. So why is he in Trump Tower to begin with? So he just walks downstairs and does this as opposed to why does he go to the border today and preempt her there? I mean, he's, he's old and lazy and he, his brain is melting before our eyes. It was also amazing to me that he goes on a long defense of Eric Adams, even though he doesn't know much about the case or, or doesn't know Eric Adams. Well, goes on this long thing. The last shouted question he gets is about Mark Robinson. Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina, nude Africa poster, uh, <laughs> self-proclaimed black Nazi, says he wants to bring slavery back. You remember that guy? Uh, Hitler. Oh, had, you mean Martin Luther King Jr. on steroids? Martin Luther one? King Jr. on steroids, which is what uh, yes. Donald Trump calls him. Uh, interested in his uh, wife's sister-in-law. His, interested in his wife's sister. Uh, <laughs> according to nude Africa. Um, anyway. <laughs> Asked him, like, have you are you reconsidering your endorsement of Mark Robinson? Donald Trump's response. Donald Trump, who just went on, who just had time to talk for 55 minutes and give a long and rambling answer where he was defending Eric Adams. This is what he said about Mark Robinson. Uh, I don't know the situation. <laughs> and then walked away. <laughs> Unfucking. I just I couldn't believe. How can he not just like throw Mark Robinson to the wolves at this point? It's Donald, it's not like Donald Trump has like, any kind of loyalty. Like it, he it's, never it's, throws people like that to the wolves, though. Yeah, I guess he doesn't want to lose his. He doesn't want to lose the Mark Robinson voters. Are there Mark Robinson voters? I think I think he'll get forty percent. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, but are they Mark Robinson voters, or they're just people who vote for any Republican? That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So then why then why not why not th- I I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Yeah, I mean it's hard. I, we're we're, we're going to lose a lot of sleep trying to understand this man. <laughs> um all right, before we go, uh a note to all the collectors out there. So, you've got your Trump trading card NFTs. You've bought Trump's coffee table book. You got Melania's memoir that she's out there hawking right now. You've stocked up on Trump and Sons private cryptocurrency World Liberty Financial. Their their crypto uh their crypto platform. And yet you still want more. Well, today is your lucky day. Take a listen. It's your favorite president, Donald J. Trump, here to introduce something really special. I think you're going to love it. My new Trump watches. This isn't just any watch. It's one of the best watches made with almost 200 grams of gold and more than 100 real diamonds. That's a lot of diamonds. I love gold. I love diamonds. We all do. Owning one puts you in a very exclusive club. I have watch number one, and I'm going to keep it. It's mine, and that's the way I want to have it. Each watch is numbered and extremely rare, a true collector's item, and it includes a personal letter signed by me. Get your Trump watch right now. Go to GetTrumpWatches.com. It's Trump time. The Trump watches are $100,000. $100,000. He's out there talking about... Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and inflation and oh, people getting killed with the cost. And he's a he's a populist, the Republican Party under Trump. There's the Workers People's Party. He's fucking selling one hundred thousand dollar watches 40 days before an election. What is happening? <laughs> what are we doing? I think I, I think that Kamala Harris 
should speak about this. I think she should like next time she's in an interview, she's at a rally. I would do an insert in the rally speech, in the stump speech. She should mock the hundred thousand dollar thing. She should paint him as this rich guy who doesn't give a shit about people. She's already doing that now. Now she's got something that's going to make news. I would put it in an ad that he's doing this. Like this is insane. Insane. I agree with all that. She should hammer it. The, the crypto thing is weird and kind of hard to explain right. to people. Totally. It's hard to make fun of someone for selling Bibles. The That's trading card tricky. thing is weird and hard to understand. NFTs. Yeah. The sneaker. The sneaker. You left out the sneakers. <laughs> sneakers you could do. The sneakers you could do. Yeah. The gold, the gold sneakers. But the Obama, $100,000 you know watch. What? I should, Obama wanted to do the sneakers in his convention speech. It fell out of a, it fell out of a draft. <laughs> Did you take it out? I don't just... know where it went. We were. It was. <laughs> you got to make. He had to make. He had to, he had he had to, to make room, room for that. Yes, that's. I think that's what happens. <laughs> I think that's what happened. But um, so the sneakers you could do. But the hundred thousand dollar watches. I would be doing this. I, I I imagine our friend David Pluff is is salivating over this. I. This is not the biggest point here, but I think my takeaway from this is that Donald Trump has fully become Fox News. Like his speeches. He's going to be selling Trump catheters are, soon. They are are Hannity. <laughs> And everything else is just one long Fox commercial. Trump, it's the Trump story of selling gold <laughs> sneaker. <laughs> Don't say, say that. That's going to happen. I know. I know. Some somewhere, uh, Dodd Junior is working on that. Um, I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know if you can't like. If we're in, if we elect this, I, I mean, who knows? Where it's a tie race. It's a tie race, and he's got an advantage on the economy. Is he's out there selling a hundred thousand dollar watches? People are most upset that costs are too high. They can't afford a home, can't afford groceries, hundred thousand dollar watches. Who's buying that? Reed, Reed wants everyone I to know. Listen our, to people who Reed, do. Reed, who who produces this show and, and writes this show, wants us to know that the fighter watch can be yours for as little as five hundred dollars. That it's not. There is a low price point for folks who don't who can't afford the hundred thousand dollars. So I guess just to be fair, did did Reed just Daniel Dale us? <laughs> <laughs> he, <laughs> he was he was very concerned that the, you know we well, just want to make sure that the hundred thousand dollars that's the top that's the top echelon that's the that's the high price point reed, reed uh is remote but i'm gonna take a close look in the next couple of weeks to see if he's got a a, uh, a fighter watch on his wrist <laughs> <laughs> look it does come with a handwritten letter from trump so i do think that that's uh that's cool all right i'm sure he personally signed all of those <laughs> all right we have some pitching of our own to do before we get to melissa murray uh on the latest episode of inside 2024 Alyssa Mastromonaco joins me and we talk about political rallies since uh, Alyssa has put together quite a few political rallies in her time. Uh, we're going to talk about how effective they are in 2024 and talk about some of the best ones that uh, that she put together back in the day to get access to exclusive subscriber series like Inside 2024 and more. Head to crooked.com slash friends now. Uh, it won't cost you one hundred thousand uh, dollars. <laughs> And uh, you won't be you won't be making Donald Trump richer. Uh, you'll be supporting independent progressive media. How's that? Uh, when we come back, Melissa Murray. Today's presenting sponsor is Simply Safe Home Security. It's almost here. Mischief season is just around the corner. Mm. Before the pranks or worse begin, ugh, you need Simply Safe to help keep an eye on your property and secure it against threats from real intruders and neighborhood pranksters. That's why our pal John Lovett has Simply Safe. Yeah, I set up a Simply Safe system, and then within days of having it set up, Ashton Kutcher was trying to break into my house. What? For a prank. Uh, That's the joke that I'm making. But then you got him. But then we got him. Uh, yeah, I set up a Simply Safe. Really easy to do. You customize it for your home. It's incredibly easy to set up. It works great, completely reliable, very fast. The app is great. Highly recommend it. With fast protect monitoring and live guard protection, Simply Safe agents can act within five seconds of receiving your alarm and can even see and speak to intruders like Ashton to stop them in their tracks. You're never going to be locked into a long-term contract, so you can cancel any time. Simply Safe has been named the best home security system by U.S. News & World Report for five years running. It's easy to install and activate your Simply Safe system in less than an hour. Or you can choose professional installation to have a pro do it for you. Protect your home with 50% off a new Simply Safe system plus a free indoor security camera when you sign up for Fast Protect monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com/crooked. That's simplysafe.com/crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Pod Save America is brought to you by Bombus. Fall is here and everyone's getting back from vacation, headed back to school, and you know what that means? It's time to get back in Bombus. The amazingly comfortable socks that give back with every purchase. Bombus has the best socks for fall to start you off on the right foot and the left foot too. 
And these aren't just your regular old fall colors. They're actually playful and fun. They've even got new sweat wicking socks to keep you energized for those fall workouts or, you know, just running after the kids as they head back to school. And can we talk about the comfort? Their merino wool socks are so cushy. They're like walking on pillows. Like walking on pillows. Who doesn't want to walk on some pillows? I do. Of course, the best thing about Bombas is that for every item you purchase, they donate one to someone experiencing housing insecurity. You can also try Bombas risk-free because they have a 100% happiness guarantee. Love Bombas. They look cool. Good for kids. Good for adults. They're super comfy. Go grab yourself uh, some Bombas. Ready to feel good and do good? Head over to bombas.com slash crooked and use code crooked for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash crooked. Code crooked at checkout. Joining us today is our pal, Melissa Murray. She's the co-host of Crooked Strict Scrutiny podcast, a professor at NYU Law, and has a new MSNBC special airing this Sunday at 9 p.m., with our friend Simone Sanders Townsend. It's called Black Women in America, Road to 2024. Welcome back, Melissa. Thanks for having me. Hmm. Great to be back. So I want to start with a clip from the special where uh, you and Simone are sitting down with uh, some young black women at a nail salon uh, who have contemplated sitting out this election. Uh, Let's listen. How are folks feeling about this election season? It's crazy, to say the least. Yeah, I'm feeling a little iffy. The first time that I was able to vote was for Hillary Clinton. Mm. That was my first and last time. Because I felt like, okay, I felt hope that Hillary would win. I felt excitement from the community around me. I just had so much hope. And then look what happened. And so now I'm like, "Mm, did my vote really matter? I don't know. Were you excited to vote before the switch? Or were you just going to sit it out? I was probably going to sit it out as well. (laughs) Oh, wow. I agree. Um, I was definitely setting it out. I was not voting at all before the switch. I'm still up in the air. Um, Obviously, I'm a Muslim woman, so um, it's very nerve wracking and very scary for me. Um, It's already hard wearing hijab in public. So when you talk about things like Project 25, it's kind of it's kind of scary. So I love hearing from undecided or persuadable voters, even if uh, what they say is frustrating or frightening, which it often is. Um, how many did you guys talk to, where, and and what else did you hear? Was that typical of, of what you heard? So we talked to a lot of women. I mean, these weren't focus groups in the way that, you know, you and Sarah Longwell have done on other shows, but we did talk to a pretty broad cross-section of women. So there are women who were older, like in their 40s and 50s, and, you know, they had very distinct views. This group of women were true millennials, like 28 years old to 32 years old. And, you know, we met at this nail salon, um, the Cosmo Beauty Bar in Washington, D.C. And I have to say, I've never felt so old. Like when they asked me, (laughs) what would you like to do with your nails? It's like, I would like them short and finger colored. And they're like, we haven't done anything like that since 1994. (laughs) So I got a true education in um, all of the new nail techniques that are available. But I also got a real education about what younger women are thinking. And, you know, one of the things that struck me is that we are hearing constantly in the media that black women are just ride or die for the Democratic Party. And I just don't think that's true. It's not true for these women. They feel overlooked. I think all of the black women that we talked to felt overlooked by the traditional political parties, that their votes were either taken for granted or were overlooked entirely. But for these younger women, um, they really felt that no one was sort of speaking to them. And to be really clear, some of their complaints didn't strike me as being entirely plausible. And and that's not because they're wrong. I I think it is a failure of messaging. So, you know, there was this one really interesting discussion about how much they were invested in student loan relief. And student loan relief actually did happen. And then it was sort of withdrawn by the United States Supreme Court. And, you know, they hadn't really heard about it. No one that they knew had gotten student loan relief. And in their view, the administration was not talking about their successes in having student loan relief go forward. And then the failure of having that eradicated by the Supreme Court in one fell swoop. So there are a lot of really interesting questions here, some of it about messaging, but also some of it about really appealing to these voters where they are. What are uh, what were some of the issues that they uh, spoke most about and and, and some concerns they had with um, with the administration. So one issue that was a particular concern, they lived in Washington, D.C., most of them did. Some were from other states like North Carolina, but um, police violence was a big issue. And again, 
it was hard to sort of, you know, understand where they were coming from on this. Like, you know, they wanted the administration to do more and be more proactive about addressing police violence. But, you know, I think there was a misunderstanding about what any presidential administration can do about the 18,000 police departments that are actually under local and municipal control. And in fact, the Biden administration did a really big effort with an executive order that provided lots of funding to local and state offices to track police violence. Violence, um, to do better training, things of that nature. They weren't really clear on that piece of it. And I think that is actually a failure of messaging from the administration, maybe also a failure on the part of those of us in the media, because, you know, for the last year and a half, we all we've talked about is Donald Trump and his criminality. We haven't talked about some of the other things that the administration has done to address really pertinent and entrenched problems like police violence. So that was one thing they talked a lot about. Student loan relief, reproductive rights was a big issue, and, and they all recognized that it was salient, but it still wasn't enough to ensure that they were going to the polls. You talked about messaging. What do you think Kamala Harris needs to do to sort of close the sale with some of these voters? So we spoke with these young women after the switch had happened. We spoke with another group of older voters um, right after the debate. And, you know, that was actually a very interesting conversation. But even after the switch had happened and Harris was the nominee going forward for the Democratic Party, they wanted real specifics from her. What are you going to do? So I think this was a little bit before she started articulating some of the particulars of her plan, certainly on the home ownership piece. But they wanted to know what she was going to do specifically about reproductive rights. And again, not a ton that a presidential administration can do without having a Congress and work being done in other branches of government. But they wanted more particulars. How are you going to shore up Roe versus Wade? What is that going to look like? Can I get behind this? And so that was really important. I think very, very particular to her. They just felt she was a bit of a cipher at that point, and they wanted someone to fill it in. Democrats' struggles with young black men have been a major topic of conversation in the cycle, so I'm very excited to have something entirely new to worry about, so thank you for that. <laughs> but do you, do you have a sense of whether it's similar dynamics um, going on with young black women? Is there something different going on? Is there something specific Democrats should be doing to um, address these concerns? Sure. I, I actually do think there is a difference here. And, you know, I, too, have heard all of the discussion about how Trump curious young black men are. I did not get the sense that these women were Trump curious at all. Um, you know, the woman who previously spoke, who was in the hijab, she was just very clear, like, I am not voting for Donald Trump. Like, I don't like him. I think he's a criminal. I mean, they, they were very clear. This was really more a question of, am I even going to get out of the House on Tuesday, November 5th to vote at all? And so this was really more, is there anything that's going to animate me to get on board with Kamala Harris and the Democrats, not what is pushing me towards Trump. So I, I think it's a different kind of conversation. I think one of the things the Democrats really need to think about is um, how they message what they've done and also how what they've done is being received. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about low information voters. I think it's unfair to talk about them in that way because it sounds as though they are purposefully disengaged. And that's that's not true. But it did occur to me when I was talking to them that these are young women who came of age after 9-11, after No Child Left Behind, when we as a country systematically stripped public education of superfluous things like PE and music and mm. art and civics education. So it's not surprising, perhaps, that they don't understand that the police department's don't get dictated to by a presidential administration. It's not surprising that they may not understand precisely that the president has to work with Congress to pass a domestic agenda. So we have really made them ill-equipped to understand how government works in a very particular way. And that's a real problem. I mean, an electorate that doesn't understand how government work is an electorate that can be preyed upon with misinformation. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what we're seeing. There is a conversation we had about how Democrats talk about their accomplishments, what we say, how we make it matter to people. There's also the broader question of how do we reach these people? Because I agree with you, low information, low information voters, is uh, it's a pejorative way of discussing it. But most voters, uh, most people in this country do not engage with news in a, in a real right. way. The, the sort of the distribution mechanisms of news are sort of broken. Did you get any sense of where these people are getting their political information, platforms or media outlets that maybe the Harris campaign or other Democrats should go on to actually inject themselves in these in front of these voters? 
So they talked about getting a lot of their information from social media and podcasts and sort of YouTube shows. Um, so Hot Ones was mentioned. Um, and I think those are really important platforms. I mean, it's not traditional news media. I mean, it's not even cable news, and so, which, you know, I, I think for a lot of them, that seemed like my parents' media. Like, mm -hmm. they're getting it from a bunch of different sources. And I think it's important for her to sort of meet them where they are, and it's non-traditional media. But I also think, again, it's worth thinking about, um, is it the case that we can only understand what the government does and how they do it if we go to law school, if we took constitutional mm -hmm. law? like? Mm -hmm. There's a real gap here, and we are going to have to address that going forward. I mean, it's all of a piece with these mm. book bans and preventing people from having certain kinds of curricula. It's all of a piece. Like, you make it harder for people to understand what's happening. You don't give them the tools to be able to critically assess it. And I think it's a lot easier to sort of put one over on them. I know you guys talk to um, some voters and other black women um, in politics and, and uh, in leadership roles. What was your main takeaway from the uh, entire special? Like, what, what did you walk away with? So black women are deeply engaged with the issues. Um, they understand that this election is probably unlike other elections. All of them seem to understand the kind of existential crisis that undergirds this election. Um, I think some of the older women were just much more explicit about it, but even the younger women were like, this is the election that I'm voting on because I'm, if I'm voting, I'm voting for my kids. Um, that was very palpable and very clear. They are engaged, their levels of engagement are different, but to a person, they all feel a little misunderstood by those who are in power. Um, you know, the women we talk to in the suburbs say that when they talk about suburban women, they're not talking about me. And the younger women feel like they've been completely overlooked. The attention we're spending on young black men talking about what animates them, we're not spending the same kind of attention talking about what is animating young black women or what is keeping them at home when they might be out there voting. So this is a sector of the electorate that's regarded as reliable and die hard. But in fact, they're more wobbly than you think. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad you guys did the special. Everyone should tune in. It is uh, Sunday night, uh, September 29th, 9 p.m. Uh, on MSNBC. Uh, and uh, you can catch Melissa on Strict Scrutiny. And uh, Simone is going to be our guest host at our uh, Philly show. Uh, we're going to do a live show in Philly uh, next uh, Sunday night. So um, check that out, too. Come visit us in Philly. Melissa Murray, thank you so much for joining us, as always. And, uh, and thanks for doing this special. Thanks so much for having me. That's it for today's show, but Dan and I are going to stick around to answer some audience questions from our Friends of the Pod subscribers and play some rounds of Take Appreciator. No, we're playing one round of Take Appreciator, Elijah. <laughs> if you're signed up for Friends of the Pod, this is already in your feed. If you're not signed up, you can join at cricket.com slash friends or through your Apple podcast feed to get this and much, much more. That's our show for today. Thanks to Melissa Murray for joining. Everyone check out Black Women in America, The Road to 2024 on MSNBC Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern. And we'll be back with a new show on Tuesday.